Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Jue, and I am an extension educator with UMass Extension. Thank you for joining us today for TikTok with Tick Report webinar. This webinar is co sponsored by UMass Extension Landscape, Nursery, and Open Forestry Program and UMass Laboratory of Medical Zoology. In today's webinar, Dr. Stephen Rich, who is a professor of microbiology and director of University of Massachusetts Laboratory of Medical Zoology, and Dr. Kirby Sturford, chief scientist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and Connecticut, Connecticut State Entomologist, will discuss tick management strategies and applicable that are applicable to landscapes in the northwest in the northeast. If you have any question during the webinar, please type it in the question box on your control panel, and Dr. Rich and Dr. Stafford will answer the questions. After the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete the survey before exiting the webinar. And now, without any further ado, here is today's webinar. spring people are worried about ticks people are trying to figure out how to get rid of ticks on their property how to protect protect themselves from tick bites and everybody's always looking for the best advice so we're going to the best advisor well thanks yeah i think with this whole spring every year uh people ask is this going to be a bad tick year and my response is every year is a bad tick year some are just worse than others but we certainly have seen a lot of uh, tick activity here in Connecticut, and I'm assuming up in Massachusetts and uh, the rest of New England and New York as well. And we've actually seen the nymphal ticks here this summer coming out just a little earlier than we normally pick them up, at least by our standard sampling method by dragging for ticks. And we're also seeing them coming into uh, the tick testing laboratory here at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. So I'm assuming you're seeing the same thing up there in Massachusetts. We are, but still predominantly adults. Yeah, the adults numbers are still there, but they're starting to drop off. And like I said, we're just picking up a few early nymphs now. Okay. Not many, but they're coming in. So when you talk about um, the ticks that come into your tick testing, you only test the, uh, the engorged ones, as I understand it, but do you also count the ones that come in that aren't engorged and they go into a database? Oh yes, I mean, we track all of them and that data is available on the Agricultural Experiment Station's website. Mm -hmm. um, that's our passive surveillance. Uh, last year, we also began active surveillance uh, across all of the uh, counties in Connecticut. So we actually have two databases now in terms of uh, tick testing. Because most of the specimens that come into our tick testing laboratory here in Connecticut, even though they come from all across the state, it's heavily weighted toward Fairfield and New Haven counties in the south central and south uh, western part of the state. Last year, as far as our active surveillance um, testing results go, we had 46% of the adults positive for Brelia burgdorferi, and then we also had 15% uh, of the nymphs that were positive, and then we had lower rates for Babesia and Anaplasma and other pathogens as well. What would you, how would you comment about the certain labs in the country that are finding a high percentage of Bartonella in ticks? Bartonella is an open question. Uh, there's no evidence yet that the tick is transmitting it yet. Those studies haven't been done. Uh, the fact that you find them infected means they pick it up. But as you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're capable of transmitting it. That's a question that still needs to be answered. So approaches to integrated tick management and tick control what what can people do what are the best practices people can do to keep themselves and their families from getting bitten by ticks okay so there's a variety of approaches that have been looked at you know both from a research standpoint and from a you know practical standpoint 
Obviously, education, which is something we're doing today, is very important. Behavior change to reduce your risk. Personal protection measures still is the primary method of reducing your risk. There are landscape modifications that can help impact the abundance of ticks. The thing to remember is that ticks, they're part of the habitat and they do require high moisture for their uh, survival. And, and so those are things that you can manipulate. The major control continues to be chemical control, at least for residential properties. So then you get into synthetic so insecticides, into a lot of interest in botanicals or essential oil-based compounds or so-called natural compounds. Research has been done on biological control. Uh, a lot of research has been done on host reduction or exclusion. That's primarily focused on white-tailed deer. Uh, host targeted acaricides, which is targeted toward white-tailed deer, as well as the white-footed mice and then host targeted vaccines. Again, that's targeted toward the white-footed mouse. Our major tick that, that we're dealing with here for most people is our black-legged tick or deer tick. It's a three host tick, which means that each stage feeds on a different host animal. So you have a larval stage, a nymphal stage, and the adult male and female stage. The immature stages, those larvae and nymphs, feed predominantly on rodents and birds, although uh, this tick is not picky. It'll feed on anything. Uh, and in the adult stage of the tick tends to feed only on medium to large mammal hosts, with white-tailed deer being the principal host for the adult stage. The white-footed mouse, which is, as well as secondarily chipmunks uh, and shrews, uh, are also reservoir hosts. Um, this is where the tick picks up the pathogen. So basically, I like to just make it simple for people that ticks out there in the wild will infect a new generation of mice, and then the mice are there to infect a new generation of ticks, and that's how it's maintained in the wild. So the mice are what we call a reservoir host. Deer do not infect the ticks that they feed on them, but they're an, they play an important role in the reproductive success of the tick. So that's why you see in these methods, when you talk about host reduction or exclusion and host targeted acaricides, these are approaches that have been researched to look at impacting either the abundance of ticks on these animals or the risk of their becoming infected. And we can simply go through these in more detail as we talk about this. Getting back to the question of risk, uh, obviously that's going to impact what kind of practices that you're going to do. And this was based on a survey done by a health department here in Connecticut for ticks that were being submitted to the experiment station for testing. They had a detailed questionnaire. People were asked what activity you were doing when you picked up the tick, and most estimated about 74% said they were just outdoors right at home. 21% were in activities away from the home, and 5% in the neighborhood. When these people are asked what activities you are actually doing when you think you picked up the tick, kind of not surprisingly, play outdoors, 47% uh, was the response. And if you look at the Lyme, national Lyme disease statistics, what's the highest rate of Lyme disease? It's in children. The lowest rate is in people in their 20s and that it increases up to the middle years, probably associated with home ownership, uh, which you see reflected in these statistics where higher, higher risk activities like yard work, 18% of those tick submissions, gardening 12%. So it's clear that the residential environment for many people poses a high risk. Uh, a lot of the control efforts therefore are focused or have been focused both practically and from a research perspective uh, on the residential environment. Yeah, I'm always surprised anecdotally when someone will say they wouldn't think about going for a hike or you know going to the nearest state park and going for a hike without their permethrin treated clothing or whatever protection they they use but they don't think about doing that when they go play in the garden, work in the garden, or you know, do things in the backyard, or vice versa. They would never go in the backyard without doing those measures, but then they don't think about it when they go to the beach. This right. Good... So when we think about how we're going to deal with the ever-increasing number of uh, cases of tick-borne disease, primarily Lyme disease, there's a lot of barriers to the adoption or use of uh, tick control measures or tick bite prevention uh, measures. And, I, and there's a, quite a few of these, but these were just a few that were highlighted in the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group reports. And if people aren't familiar with that, the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group was authorized by the Century uh, Cures Act. And so 
the first report to Congress, which is a nice kind of exec, uh, executive summary of all the different subcommittee reports to that group, working group, uh, was uh, published in 2018. It's the report to Congress for 2018. It's available online. So it's a very useful doc document for people that are interested in just a broad overview of the whole Lyme disease and tick-borne disease issue. Um, but some of the barriers have been things like uh, the skepticism and public distrust of chemical pesticides and repellents. Uh, that's a common question. Some people are, are very, you know, wary of using these uh, chemicals for controlling ticks and, you know, want to know how effective they are. The issue of social acceptability of deer management, and we'll talk a little bit about this a little later, but several studies have shown that either controlling ticks or uh, having an impact to ticks related to deer management approaches can actually significantly reduce tick numbers. Willingness to pay for effective tick control measures, that's an issue. There's been generally a lack of funding for large-scale neighborhood or community or area-wide studies. So increased pesticide resistance is a concern. A lot of people raise the issue of pollinator health uh, concerns, particularly with the use of chemical pesticides. As reflected in our current coronavirus crisis or uh, pandemic, declining public health in general, but specifically in this case, entomology workforce, and a lack of funding to support employment to sustain tick-borne disease prevention research was identified as an issue. And then, of course, unlike certain states will have mosquito control districts, there's a lack of municipal or local vector control efforts specifically aimed at ticks. And these are just a few of the things that were identified as barriers to managing our increasing Lyme disease and other tick-borne disease issues. Here in the state of Massachusetts, between nine and $13 million a year goes into mosquito control, mosquito surveillance and or control. I don't know what those numbers were last year with all the triple EV, but those are estimates, annual estimates for over several years. And the amount of money that goes into surveillance for tick-borne diseases and or control for ticks is nothing, basically. Do you have a sense, other than the fact that it's historical and it's been institutionalized for mosquito control and, and abatement, why Why would that be? Why Why do you think, it, is, is it so in Connecticut? And if so, why? Yeah, well, here in Connecticut, we do have some mosquito control, but we don't have mosquito control districts like Massachusetts or say New Jersey does. Some of them have their own budgets. Uh, we don't have county government here in Connecticut either. Part of it has to do with the biology. I mean, we do have, for partly for historical reasons, uh, we do have fairly decent control methods for mosquitoes. Ticks, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And I think really the big drawback is, is basically how you target these interventions. Mosquitoes, uh, you can do uh, community uh, area interventions or controls much more easily than you can ticks. Getting back to what we were just discussing where, where most people pick up ticks, it's right on the residential property and ticks don't fly. So how do you access or uh, offer a community-based control on individual private properties? And mm -hmm. so that raises some real difficulties. And consequently, it's become a homeowner by homeowner intervention, what a particular homeowner wants to do to try to control ticks on their property. And that gets back to the willingness, how much they're willing to pay for that, because it's not being done through tax dollars or through you know, some other method. So yeah, so this just kind of elaborates on what we were kind of just discussing. I mean, it really gets down who is responsible for tick control on private properties versus community and public lands, including green belts and school grounds and city and county and state parks. That responsibility still kind of evolves on the individual homeowner at this point. Tick control on their individual property and then taking personal protection measures when they visit those green belts and city and county and state parks. So essentially at this point, it's still a homeowner problem, which are relying largely on licensed commercial pesticide applicators. And most of the tools that we're gonna, we kind of highlighted earlier, and we'll be talking a little bit more about, we discussed this, uh, tick management toolbox are not available to homeowners, at least not yet. So the commercial pesticide professional applicator model, basically the applicators will be hired, they come in, they treat the property, go to the next property, and it doesn't really allow time for consideration of individual habitat and risk conditions and tick density, things like that, 
And then you really get down to the question where a lot of people ask, what's effective? What really works? And right. that's a big question as well. You know, the thing is, it's kind of interesting. Of course, right now, schools are not in session, uh, obviously, because of the pandemic and generally are not active in the summer unless there's summer programs going on. But a lot of people ask, well, what's the risk around schools? Well, it depends on the school landscaping. And if you really think about it, most schools are very open. They're not really good tick habitat, except the long landscaping along the edge of the school grounds. Now, this particular chart called a particular park, kind of a little pun on names there, this was a graphic that was designed for part of a education outreach quite a few years ago in terms of opening things up, more sunlight, uh, having low mowed grass, more barriers along the edge. So you're really thinking about it like an open soccer field. Kids are not going to be picking up ticks in the middle of that soccer field. They're going to be picking up ticks when they chase a ball off into the woods on the edge or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's getting back to the landscaping of the edge and the edges and paths that kids use to walk to school are probably the highest area of risk. And this, these principles can be applied to other areas as well, parks, recreation areas, as well as your own yard. And these kinds of assessments, usually we're thinking predominantly about black-legged ticks and not necessarily dog ticks or lone star ticks that will have a little difference. Associated Correct. With risks. Yeah. I mean, I mean, majority of what I guess up in Massachusetts, mainly you're seeing um, black-legged ticks and dog ticks, correct? Yeah. And that same thing is here, although we're starting in Connecticut to see a steady but still relatively low increase in Lone Star tick submissions. And I, we've actually discovered a couple of established populations along coastal Connecticut. So that tick is moving north. It's something to be aware of. It's a more aggressive tick. It moved on to Long Island. Uh, in the early 1990s. It's extremely abundant on Long Island, and I think that has to do with climate change. Quite frankly, we're seeing higher winter temperatures, and our studies have actually shown that the Lone Star tick can survive the winters here in Connecticut, and a small proportion even survived in studies through the winter with snow and leaf litter cover up in Portland area of Maine. So we're expecting that tick to continue to creep along the New England coast northward. Yeah, we see Lone Star ticks from every county in Massachusetts. We don't believe they're established in every county, but Larry Dapskis in, in Barnstable County has identified a spot in, in Cape Cod, Sandy Neck, where they are where they're established. In Long Island, we see more Lone Star ticks submitted than black-legged ticks these days to our testing service. So they've really taken hold there. Right. The dynamics are changing. So I think, um, you know, we will say, and even up in Maine, they do get Lone Star ticks occasionally, but all of those are undoubtedly brought in on migrating birds. No established populations yet. I think it'll be harder still for the tick to become established in more of the interior parts of New England. It'll be a coastal phenomenon for, for quite a while, but it's still, uh, it's something to be aware of. And of course, that tick has its own pathogen, human pathogens that it can transmit as well. Now, in some place like Long Island, can you imagine a scenario where there'd be some kind of competitive exclusion where Lone Star ticks would outcompete black-legged ticks for some limiting resource, whether it's adult hosts or they, so they feed predominant, they feed all three stages on white-tailed deer. So could they be squeezing out black-legged ticks for adult breeding sites on those white-tailed deer? It's possible. Uh, there's not a lot of data on that. There is some in habitat uh, differentiation on Long Island. Uh, mm -hmm. talking to the people there. More of a moisture drier versus more moist uh, soil areas. There seems to be some kind of a habitat differentiation there as well. But it's possible the one site I discovered in Connecticut with huge numbers of Lone Star ticks, there was a few black-legged ticks there and a few dog ticks, but not many. Interesting. Uh, and predominantly what were on the deer, heavily infested with just strictly Lone Stars. So as we were uh, talking about the risk at schools, where I think the children would be most likely to pick up a tick if they're actually cutting through the woods to get to school. The thing to think about here, it's kind of interesting that we're seeing a lot of state parks either closed or closed early simply because of the number of people that are taking advantage of being outdoors. 
here, particularly with the uh, coronavirus stay at home orders, combined with the encouragement to, to go outdoors, but keep your uh, social distancing, that's important. But also bear in mind, you'll also need that tick bite prevention. And I'm wondering if we'll see an increase in the number of tick submissions, both there in Massachusetts and here in Connecticut, because it was more people are spending times outdoors, at least anecdotally, I'm seeing more people seem to be outdoors hiking along trails and so forth than you see in a normal spring. So this is just a graph to kind of let people think. So there on one side, you got your sick, safer trails. They're paved kind of more or less and very wide, very easy to avoid uh, brushing up against the vegetation versus uh, trails or paths that are cutting right through the woods. And obviously the two people illustrated here are not using tick bite prevention measures unless perhaps maybe they got repellent on their legs, but I wouldn't count on it. So getting back to what we were talking about, how schools are so open and not good habitat, uh, this applies to the residential landscape as well. So what we have here in my diagram from my tick handbook is what I call it a tick safe zone, or it should be like a tick safer zone. Like I said, ticks require high humidity uh, that you find in the leaf litter, uh, underground cover. Uh, I've collected ticks and pachysandra right next to front doorsteps, you know, right next to the curled up uh, garden hose. So you got to think cover and, you know, also think about New England stone walls. I mean, we've got several hundred thousand miles of stone walls out through New England and they're all mouse hotels. So a lot of great habitat. So what we see here is a property that was, you know, quite dense, a lot of shade. And actually that property in uh, O-Lime there uh, had, uh, actually it was in Lime, had a lot of ticks. And then the homeowners opened things up, a lot more sunlight and so forth. And yeah, there's still ticks there in the woods, but the number of ticks on the lawn was decreased quite substantially. Landscaping barriers can help reducing the number of ticks moving into the yard by maybe half. But again, you need a dry substrate. We used wood chips in our early trials that we did because that's what we could afford to use. But it could be any kind of landscaping type material. And it kind of also forms like a psychological barrier too, that this is your tick you know, margin between your tick zone and your tick safer zone. And then I don't know, perhaps David, uh, you've probably seen a lot of home sites where, where do they put the swing sets? In the woods. In the shade kind of understand that, but that's also the tick zone. So, you know, when I'm giving talks to the public, I'm basically, what you're telling the kids to do is go out and pick up ticks. <laughs> anyway, so you want to pull them out and kind of more like the bottom picture there where it's a little more sunnier location uh, for the place set, you know, as well. So again, stressing that you think environment, you know, people pick up ticks just going to the mailbox. Maybe you have a long line of Pachysandra or, you know, unmaintained edge right along heading out to the mailbox by the road. And I'll give you a really nice anecdotal example of a woman who was participating in one of our studies. We visited her property. She had a big circular lawn around her house, couldn't find any ticks. And then I took a little walk along her unmaintained driveway all the way down to her mailbox, that little grassy edge, and I picked up 30 adult ticks in one pass. And she'd actually had a really close call with uh, ehrlichiosis, which we now know, uh, know as anaplasmosis at the time. So the following year, uh, when we paid a visit again, all that area was carefully mowed and her entire driveway was paved. Mm. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so you really got to think about, your, you know, where your potential risks of exposure are. And then, like I said, it could be just simple as a trip to the mailbox. So you mentioned mouse hotels when you talked about the stone walls it's always a, uh, a surprise to me also that people will say wait a minute mice are involved with the cycle of a deer tick i thought it was deer and people don't sometimes find it hard to accept that it's not the deer that are associated with the predominant pathogen burley burgdorferi but mice so what about mouse control what about tick tubes or transgenic mice or yeah, we'll be getting to that a little bit in a moment when we talk about some other approaches. But that does bring up the issue of you hear, you know, people saying, well, it's the mice. And then other people will say, no, it's the deer. Right. And the reality is it's both. 
They right. both have their roles in the whole cycle of the tick and you know the Lyme disease pathogen, Borrelia burgdorferi. So getting back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, the adult stage of the tick feeds predominantly on deer, although it feeds on other medium-sized mammals, you know, fox, coyotes, so on and so forth as well. Um, but deer's the main host. So deer is the reproductive host. So think about each engorged female tick feeding on that white-tailed deer is gonna drop off and lay about 2,000 eggs. So the deer are, you know, pretty closely tied to the kind of tick population you're gonna have, but they don't infect ticks. Deer are not reservoir hosts. Uh, they can get infected, but they don't maintain the infection and transmit it to any ticks that are feeding on them. So when we're talking about, you know, which one plays a role, both of them do. As we get dig into some of the factors in the landscape that promote uh, survival of ticks, what I illustrated here was just the first year of a three-year study that was done looking, that we looked at the combinations of leaf, presence of leaf litter and snow on the survival of the black-legged tick. And we did this for the Lone Star tick as well. And what we found is leaf litter increased overwinter survival of the black-legged tick nymphs, as well as the uh, uh, Amblyum americanum or Lone Star tick adults. And the differences were slight, but they were statistically significant. So where we did not remove any of the leaves and did not remove any of the snow, those are insulators for the winter. And so the survival was 94%. Where we removed both the leaves and the snow from the plots, survival was 77%. So leaf litter, it's an insulating blanket as is snow. I don't know, uh, Stephen, with how often you get asked, you know, the reporters will call and they will ask, this was a really bad winter. How are the ticks? And basically my answer is they're doing just fine <laughs> underneath that nice insulating snow. So a really dry snowless winter probably would increase some of the mortality of the nymphal ticks for the winter, but it's not gonna get rid of them. Interestingly, uh, a, a recent study looked at the leaves that are blown or raked to the edge of the lawn, and they found higher numbers of nymphs in those leaves at the managed edge versus what they found on the natural edge or natural forest. So that raises the question, if you're clearing leaves, which does reduce the number of ticks around the perimeter of the property, if you're piling them up, that may be an area that you'll have an increased risk of running into ticks. So maybe removing them off site, bagging them, or maybe properly composting them would be the better answer in that case. So that kind of covers a landscaping aspect of, of things. Mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned earlier, the primary method of controlling ticks on the residential property is by the application of, of caricides. These are basically insecticides that are used for ticks and mites. So they're closely related. That's why they're called caricides. The predominant class of insecticide that's used today are the pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are synthetic derivatives of the natural pyrethrin, and it's and also among some of the most common ornamental turf insecticides that you can. Uh, by either both by homeowners uh, as well as professional applicators. So this chart basically summarizes some uh, uh, years of research that's been published that was um, actually summarized by uh, Lars Eisen and Mark Dolan in a paper in 2016. Uh, there's been other work since then. But basically you can see that if you look at reduction of NIMPs, most of the studies uh, found very high control uh, with the applications of these various pyrethroid insecticides uh, lasting up to many weeks, depending on how long the study was actually conducted. Classic carbaryl or seven that a lot of people may be familiar with was also quite effective uh, for periods of weeks to almost several months. And again, I think the real issue with these is not that the insecticides uh, or acaricides are not effective, it just happens to be how well they're applied and where they're applied. Mm -hmm. So going back to that earlier illustration of the yard, you know, the majority of the ticks that I've collected at homes, you know, were within three yards of the edge of the lawn 
with the stone walls, the forest edge, uh, ornamental plantings. You don't find them out in the open, sunny, manicured front lawn. So that's generally where the applications are made. But again, that might not necessarily be the only place you'll encounter ticks. Mm -hmm. So there was a large tri-state study um, that looked at the application of bifentrin, the first pyrethroid listed in this chart, although they only got 60% control, which kind of surprised me, actually. I would have expected better. But nonetheless, they had a large number of homes that were treated with the bifentrin. They had an equal number of homes that were sprayed with water. And so then they looked at, uh, there was actually, let me put it this way. At the end of the study, they found no difference in the number of people getting tick bites or getting Lyme disease between the treated and untreated properties. So does that mean it doesn't work? Well, it means the application didn't reduce the risk of getting Lyme disease. It probably killed ticks. So that gets also to get back to our earlier discussion about where people are actually picking up ticks in their yard. Mm -hmm. Again, these were just perimeter sprays. The entire property was not sprayed. And getting back to my example of just going down to the mailbox, if that wasn't an area that was sprayed, you'd still be at risk of you know, picking up, up ticks. Another area that I spent a lot of time working with actually led to the registration of Metarhizium anisophily for uh, tick control. Uh, this is a fungus. These entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi, and there's a number of them, uh, are fungus that are specific to killing insects. Uh, and it, it varies depending on the type of fungus and the insects that they'll affect. But uh, it's, a, it's a biocontrol. And so the studies have ranged from 36 to 96% control with the application of Metarhizium anisophily. It goes under the trade name MET52. So it's generally, I would expect probably around more than 70% range control. Well, that's what we got in some of our work, but it, it's certainly an alternative to using chemicals. It's a suspension of the spores for people that perhaps are familiar with Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, for caterpillar control or mosquito control, it's analogous to that. It's a biocontrol. Mm -hmm. But uh, given the concerns with pyrethroids or other chemical uh, insecticides, there's been a lot of interest in products that are botanically or essential oil based. And most of these are basically off what the EPA calls their 25B list. So if people are interested in knowing what those are, online, just simply look up the EPA's 25B list. This is your minimum risk compounds. There's actually two lists, one for general use and one for food use. Uh, and these include things like rosemary oil, wintergreen oil, garlic, cinnamon, and uh, geranol, things like this. And the thing is, these materials can be formulated into products and they do not have to do any uh, toxicity testing. They're generally considered safe and they also don't have to prove it effective. So it's very easy to put these together and market them. And so it comes up to a question, do they really work? So here is a product that was initially early tested uh, and has, has been published called IC2. Uh, and it actually surprisingly uh, got really good results with it. It contains rosemary oil, peppermint oil, wintergreen, and a few other ingredients, but they actually got really good results with it. Uh, the original IC2 is no longer available. Um, but there's a very close, almost, a, almost identical product called EcoExempt IC2. And, but there's a whole diversity of these products. Garlic, which is really a repellent, not a toxicant, can reduce tick activity by roughly half for a couple of weeks. So not all that effective. To me, it'd be something you might use right before a wedding party in the yard. Although right now, nobody's having wedding parties in the yard. But in any event, most of these essential oil products don't appear to be very effective. So there's very little published results. Um, there are ongoing trials. So the studies that have been done at the University of Rhode Island and some studies that have been done by my colleagues on Long Island have found that ef efficacy is probably 5% for like cedar oil. Another cedar oil product was 30 to 40%, which still isn't that good. So right now, there's a lot of commercial applicators that are offering organic control using a cedar oil product. And the limited data so far uh, would indicate it's not that effective. 
So there's increasing evidence that the formulation, actually how you take these uh, essential oils and how they're actually put together makes a really big difference on their efficacy. So there's a lot of unanswered questions with that. At this point, still relatively limited testing uh, of these various products. What I'm always struck by these kinds of things are, let's take, for example, just this figure of 93%. So a 93% reduction. If you take the number of 2,000 eggs from a single female, from an engorged female, then that means that you're going to leave behind 140 ticks on average from that batch. And it only takes one tick to get you sick. So yeah, you've gone from 2,000 to 140. That's a good 93% reduction, but it only takes one tick to make a difference. And the other uh, aspect of this is if you've got 93% coverage in your backyard, but then you wander through the path to go to the neighbors for a barbecue and the path doesn't have the treatment or the neighbors don't have the treatment, your 93% protection is, is something less than that at that point. Correct, which gets back to the example I gave of going to the mailbox, mm -hmm. or pro which is likely the main reason for the results that we saw on that huge tri-state study that I mentioned, right. where they saw no reduction in the tick bites. So you're balancing, we know that these compounds, these chemicals will kill ticks, but you get into issues of coverage, um, the quality of the application, the penetration of the vegetation, all these kind of other factors that impact true uh, real world efficacy. Yeah, I think it just all ties into your very first slide, which I think is the great message of an integrated approach. So you got a product that's 100% eff efficacious, still wear your DEET, still think about permethrin treated clothing, still do your tick checks, still do everything else that you're doing in addition, right? Right. So even if you kill 100% of the ticks where you make the application, your, that application isn't going to cover everywhere. No, I think that's a good point to be reminded of. So some of the other approaches that have been looked at from a research standpoint, and occasionally, uh, and actually some uh, applied products, uh, have focused on those two major hosts that we've talked about, the white-tailed deer, the reproductive hosts, and the rodent reservoirs, such as the white-footed mice and chipmunks. So with deer, the research has looked at exclusion. Uh, a few of us did some real early studies uh, back in the early 1990s, looking at the impact of deer fencing on, on tick populations. And the reality is if you exclude deer from a area of just acres, it does have a significant impact on the number of ticks inside the uh, fenced area. Uh, because you're not having the female ticks uh, dropping off deer on the property. So you're, you're really reducing the life cycle there. Uh, deer reduction has been a number of several different studies. And we've act actually published a study where reducing deer did actually impact the incidence of Lyme disease. But there's a lot of pushback against this approach and partly because it's clear that if the, in order to have an impact, you've got to reduce the deer population down to around 10 deer per square mile. And typical densities really run anywhere from 30 to 60 or more uh, in many areas. So you're talking about a substantial reduction required to uh, impact the population. Now, I will say one good example of this is Monhegan Island. It's an island off the coast of Maine. Deer were brought there in the 1950s for hunting purposes. They were never native to the island. It's too far off the shore for deer to swim to it. And the residents there got tired of getting Lyme disease. So the deer were eliminated from the island. And now today they have virtually no ticks. The few ticks that they get are some that come off migrating birds. But there's no reproducing established population on the island anymore. And then the last approach uh, is the treatment of deer. And what you see in the lower corner there is a device that was developed by the Agricultural Research Service at the USDA. It's called a four-poster. Um, it contains corn, whole kernel corn is the feed attractant. It kind of comes off in two little troughs there with two paint rollers. So on either side, hence the name four poster, the, four, the rollers are treated with the insecticide permethrin. So you're topically treating the deer to kill the ticks that are on them. And there's been a number of those studies that have been done and it can be highly effective in reducing tick abundance 
but it is a lot of work to maintain these four posters and are not something that an ad individual homeowner can use. There are restrictions by wildlife agencies on their use and distribution. New York does not even allow them with only a couple of exceptions on Long Island at this point. You know, they take a lot of work. We're actually using them right now on that island where we found that huge population of Lone Star ticks. And we're actually really significantly knocking down the population there through this approach. But again, it's a, it's a tool, potential tool for certain neighborhoods or so forth. But again, uh, you, you require a number of these four posters. There was a study that was done with these on Cape Cod and the islands there. They did not get much results. And part of that is they were trying to see if, if they could get by with a lower density uh, of these four posters. Uh, generally use about, you know, one per, um, you know, 50 hectares. So with that lower density, it just didn't have the effect that they were hoping for. Uh, another approach, of course, is uh, targeting the mice. The original product approach for that were the tick tubes. There's actually two brands of the tick tubes now. These are permethrin treated cotton balls. Uh, the idea is the mice would take the cotton back to their nests and it would kill the ticks there that are on the mice or present in the uh, mouse's nest. Uh, I should point out chipmunks do not use these. So some very early studies with these uh, tick tubes uh, found some reductions on the mice, but no impact on the number of infected ticks on the treated properties. Uh, a more recent study that just came out did show a, some reduction in questing ticks on the property. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was around 20% or so. Um, the another approach is the bait box. Um, oh, I should mention that the cost of the tubes is roughly about $3 a tube. The bait box, on the other hand, uses fipronil. Fipronil is the active ingredient and frontline for flea and tick control on dogs and cats. And application of frontline to a mouse, it'll kill any ticks that mouse encounters for up to 30 days. So that's the concept behind this. You got two non-toxic food blocks inside. There's a wick containing the fipronil. Mice come in to feed. Uh, and chipmunks can access it as well. And if they get treated, then instead of picking up ticks and infecting them, they should be picking up ticks and killing them. So the original study with this that was that we conducted on an island in Connecticut was quite successful. And, however, it was an island population. Uh, and subsequent studies have shown various degrees of impact by using this box. So they're put out about every, you know, 30 feet around the perimeter of the property ideally in two rows, uh, but they cost around $40 a piece. It's professionally uh, applicator applied. Uh, you can't, this is not a homeowner product. Uh, the tick tubes you can buy yourself. So these are the approaches that have taken in terms of trying to reduce either tick numbers or uh, infection rate in, in the ticks tied to the animal hosts. So, I didn't figure we'd have a whole lot of time to talk about all of the integrated approaches that could be taken. And we'll discuss this a little bit, but I thought these two are two publications uh, on integrated uh, tick management in the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. And they're both open access, so they're readily available to anyone who wants to read them. And it's kind of reviews of the various studies that have been done with this approach. So, all the tools that are available from spraying, um, treating mice, treating deer, uh, landscape work, all that has been examined at one point or another in various studies. Although there has been few true integrated studies with the black-legged tick. We did publish one where we looked at a combination of spraying that MET-52, that uh, fungus-based uh, product, uh, along with the uh, fipronil bait boxes. And we got a 66% re uh, reduction in the risk of encountering one, even one infected nymphal tick. So those approaches can have an impact, but again, they're not 100%. But this research is continuing and there are several other integrated studies that are going on uh, right now. So we'll see. Uh, it's a, that's one of those areas that was identified that more funding needs to be done to really to see what really works for people. 
we've kind of make a quick go through on on some of these tick control measures and so forth and and we didn't really go into a whole lot of detail on personal protection measures but um none of them will do anything if you don't use them so this i highlighted a study of a uh, national uh, health style survey that was published back uh, a few years ago and they looked at the use of the prevention measures within each region so what i tore out of that national survey was New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. And so what they showed was in this graph here, you'll see percentage of those reporting tick exposure of a household member in 2009, and then percentage of those reporting a healthcare consultation because of that. So in New England, 29, almost 30% reported a tick exposure in just that one year. In the Mid-Atlantic states, it was 24%. So if you look at the chart overall nationally, you'll see only 21% were using a repellent, a little higher in New England, 26%, 26% in the Mid-Atlantic states as well. Showering after coming in uh, and then doing tick checks. A lot of people, you know, 30 to 40% or so were indicating they were doing tick checks, but that means that 70% weren't. And then other steps. And then look how many said they were doing nothing. Nationally, it was 51%. New England, a little better. It was almost 36%. In Mid-Atlantic states, it was 45%. But very small fraction indicated they were using any yard pesticides. Here in New England, it was 7.2%. Mid-Atlantic, only 6.8%. And then would not use yard insecticides, which I thought was interesting. 14% and 10% for New England and Mid-Atlantic, respectively getting back to the concern of, of applying chemical pesticides uh, to the yard. So the issue here is, is that, you know, we do have techniques in the toolbox that can help reduce risk to ticks as, uh, that we went through, but if you don't use them, they aren't gonna do anything. I guess we didn't really talk that much about the actual personal protection measures. The tick is a well-established the environment. It feeds on a multitude of hosts. There are very few weak links. Personally, I think, I mean, if you could wave a magic wand and make the deer disappear, the ticks would disappear for the most part, uh, largely. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. You go back historically and we know that ticks were abundant in the 1700s. There was a Swedish naturalist named Pierre Kalm who kept a journal of his travels. It's actually a very fascinating book. Uh, but in his uh, journal, he noted several times how bad the ticks were. You know, he said well, one place, so when he was in New Jersey, he said, even though the place be ever so pleasant, you couldn't sit down without having a whole swarm of them on you. We also know that by the uh, late 1800s, around 1870s, uh, nearly 100 years after uh, Pierrecom published his journal, that you couldn't find any ticks. The state entomologist of New York, Asa Finch at the time, noted that through the area that Pierrecom had traveled, you just couldn't find any ticks. What happened during that issuing 100 years? We cut down all the trees. Yeah. We hunted out all the deer. Uh, I'm not sure what the figure for Massachusetts is, but it's estimated in Connecticut in 1896, there was only 12 deer in the state. No habitat, no hosts, no ticks. So basically what happened is we think the ticks survived an isolated refuge on parts of Long Island, islands off of the Cape. Uh, and then as the forest came back and the wildlife came back, the tick just simply started respreading its range again. And then people often ask, well, where did it come from? Well, it's, that's parts a little unclear, but ticks that were collected in the 1800s in Europe and tested were found positive for the Lyme disease spirochete. And then, you know, if you really want to know what's the oldest, and people ask, well, really, how is it really recent where did it come from? And I says, well, you know what the oldest suspected known human case of Lyme disease is? Yes. The Iceman in Europe. Over 5,000 years ago, he was so well preserved, there was actually some evidence that he had Lyme. So that brings up the question. It's been around for a long time. It's just that, you know, it disappeared. And then with the regrowth of the forests, uh, and the habitat and the wildlife, it kind of resurged and it's been spreading ever since. Indeed. Yeah, so now it's the number one 
Number one problem in the time when we don't have uh, some of the problems we hear about these days, right? No. Nope. That's right. Well, it's the leading vector-borne disease, and um, you know, even though the CDC gets you know thirty thousand to forty thousand cases reported a year, it's it's pretty well recognized. That's only ten percent of the diagnosed cases. So there's a lot of Lyme disease out there. A lot of Lyme disease, indeed, and a lot of other tick-borne infections as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirby Stafford of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. It was a pleasure having you as our guest today. Folks, if you're enjoying these YouTube videos on Tick Report Media, by all means, send us your feedback, send us your comments, send us ideas for new topics you'd like to hear more about, and we'll keep bringing them to you. Thanks, and take care.